the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father, we continue on the journeys which Paul, which is our personal journey, to get to heaven, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for your divine presence. And journey us, Lord, closer and closer to you. And may we realize that there's going to be lots and lots of obstacles along the journey. And Lord, as the psalm says, may we scale all the walls and come to you. Bless us in the power of your great Holy Spirit. Bless this word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All God's people say, Amen. amen. All right, we're at the tail end of chapter 20. Two. So tonight we'll do 23. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 22, please. Verse 28. And we'll head into chapter 23. Amen. Yeah. You like, you like to study this uh, Abba? Yes. Abba. All right. We've got to make sure Abon is on every single table around the country. Amen. The commander replied, I acquired this citizenship for a, a, a large amount of money. Some money. Remember, Paul is in Jerusalem. There was two types of guards there. Does everybody know that? There was the religious guards, and there was about 800. And those are the ones who went to the Garden of Gethsemane to rest Jesus. Does everybody know that? There's 800 guards. That's a lot of people. Amen? The religious guards? The religious guards. Then there was the, uh, the secular guards called the Romans. So when Paul is arrested here, so to speak, and they're ready to flog him, it would be under the Roman system, which means you could flog as many times as you want. The Jewish people had, because of the Old Testament, 39 times. And Paul received that here in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. We hear that it's, that, he got, that happened to him five times. So his back was always being scarred for the Lord. Yes? And that your greatest suffering is going to be with your own people. Have you noticed that yet? You haven't noticed that yet? Yes. You have noticed that. Yeah. Your, own, your biggest suffering is going to be with your own family. Have you noticed that yet? Yes. Yes. So your own people and your own family. You haven't noticed that yet? First Peter 4. So uh, right now, a commander of Rome says to him, I bought this citizenship. And Paul says, as he's ready to be scourged, I got one better than you. I was born a Roman citizen. Oh. So immediately they, they put away the what? The whips. They put away the whips. Because you've got to, you cannot whip a Roman citizen without a trial. And by the way, they don't usually go through um, the, they don't go through the tortured, oh, that's, that's non-Romans go through the tortured part. So um, they get a quick exit of death, like Paul got his head chopped off. That's really quick, amen? So he says here, verse 28, Paul said, I was born one, verse 29, and once those were going to interrogate him, backed away from him, and the commander, came, the commander became alarmed when he realized that he was a Roman citizen and that he hadn't bowed. You're not allowed to do that. Now Paul is going to open his mouth, and he shouldn't have opened his mouth, but he did. Have we ever got in trouble for opening your mouth before? Yeah, yeah everybody. <laughs> and when he opened his mouth, he now comes before what is called, if he, if verse 30, he becomes a group called the Sanhedrin. Anybody remember who the Sanhedrin are? Just to review, yes. they started in the book of Exodus because Moses needed help in judging people. So his father-in-law, Jethro Bodine, from the Beverly Hillbillies, Jethro, he's the first convert in the Bible, right? Yes. Jethro says, Mo, you're going to need some help because you've got two and a half million people. How can you possibly judge them all? 
So they raised up at that time 70 judges, and this is called today the Sanhedrin. So when Jesus was on trial, he was in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, when our Lord was on trial, they would put 35 on one side, 35 on the other side, and they, you, you can see them there in these like circular benches, and then they would put the grand poobah in the middle called the high priest. You are all famously know the, the one of Caiaphas. You've heard of him. 35 on this side, 35 on this side, Caiaphas. So when Jesus was in there, the Sanhedrin, you would go up the stairs, short, long, short, long, short, long, because when you come into the temple area, you come in praising God. So when you're going up the stairs, even your body is in a movement. Then they had a very long, long, long building. And so as soon as you come in from the light, you go into, excuse me, the darkness. And so this long, long building was the Sanhedrin. Then you have the big gigantic plaza. And then right beyond the plaza was the temple. So Jesus is going to be in the Sanhedrin. And now, verse 30, here's the Sanhedrin. The next day, wishing to determine the truth about why he was being accused by the Jews. Now remember, again, Jews in the book of Acts and the book of John have a demerit on us because it means they're attacking Jesus. Some people who read this passage call it anti-Semitic bias. When I heard that, I went nuts. It doesn't mean that. But yet they'll say, well, and then they'll say, change the Bible. How many would like that to be changed? We cannot, we cannot change one word of this book. Because there's a warning in the book of Deuteronomy. If you change one word, you're going to get all the plagues there, man. How many want some plagues? And if you add to it, so you can't add to it, or you can't take away from it. So what, what happens with the Bible from Deuteronomy and the book of Revelation? What happens is there's a locked in. How many know the Bible is locked? Is that interesting? And who broke that rule? Mark Luther. You ever hear of him? Yes. You ever hear of the Lutheran Church? Now, what did he do? He did a no no. He was translating the Bible from the Latin into German. Was is lost? He came to Romans 3 and he added the word, You're saved by faith. And then he says, I think this would sound better if you read the word alone in there. So in German he wrote the word alone. I and so he added to the Bible. And now, which I get a little annoyed at, he's being touted as a great hero. He had some good points, and then he had not so good points. One day I, I I would love to go through the, those differences with us. So the next day, wishing to determine the truth about why he was being accused by the Jews, he freed him and ordered the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin to convene. So where are we right now? We're in that long tubular hall. And who is in there? Jesus. And where is he going to stand? Exactly where Jesus was. 35 on this side. 35 on that side, and the high priest in town. Are you getting the picture? And I, I, I believe he stands on the very same spot our Lord did. The spot. Would you like to stand on the spot? Then he brought Paul down and made him stand before him. Verse 1. Paul looked intently at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers. Now, 
he uses a very strong word. Now remember, Paul always considered himself still Jewish. Yes. He did not consider himself, he did not go around and say, I am a Christian, even though that was a derogatory term. There's no here. We need it. We need somebody to get this formula to get this board thing. <laughs> he said, a death pool. Now, when he says the word brothers, if he was speaking in Hebrew, what's a Hebrew word? from Greek and Hebrew, it means, ready? We brothers, we come from the same womb, W-O-M-B. My brothers, I have conducted myself with a perfectly clear conscience. Now we just read about his clear conscience in Acts 20. What's a clear conscience if you're a Christian? Is anybody here a Christian? Nobody? I got a lot of work. <laughs> if you have a clear conscience, you need to say, you have done all that God has told you to do. You have a need to say you're living the way God wants you to. You need to say, I go to bed tonight with a clear, because I've done what God wanted me to do. I am doing what God wants me to do. So how many have a perfectly clear conscience? Verse number one. Before God to this day. So how many have a perfectly, anybody have a perfectly clear conscience to God to this day? No, I refer you to, if you want to read more about a perfectly clear conscience, it's cleansed with the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews chapter 10, which says that you and I should be able to confess Jesus Christ. And what are we all afraid of? We don't like to, you're going to have your opportunity on Monday. You've got interesting people you're going to be with, right? Anybody have interesting people you're going to be with? Nobody? Yes. You have to eat your linguine and your 28 fishes and everything else. It's only seven. That's Christmas. Well, when you're in an Italian household, they just multiply. Mm -hmm. Amen? How can anybody eat them? Anyway, so <laughs> the high priest of the first two, Ananias, ordered his attendants to strike his mouth. There we go. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. So you could just see whack right on the mouth. Now when you whack somebody on the mouth, that is what is called super insult. You are not allowed to touch anybody's face. Remember the duel where the, the guy would take a glove and go. <laughs> Remember those days? The reason they did that is that they super insulted you. You're not allowed to touch anybody's face. So now comes the hand right by the old kisser. And right in the old kisser, as I was telling you last night, right in the old kisser is, this is your worship power. So Paul gets whacked. And then he says there, verse 3, then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> That's tough. Now, guess what happened here? Here is a very rare Bible verse. Did he sin by doing that? <coughs> yes. We have, we have an account of Paul committing a sin. Because he spoke against God's anointing. Now I know nobody in here ever spoke against a priest before, right? <laughs> now in the book of Exodus 21 and 22, it says you shall never speak against a priest, a leader. Now by the way, if you've done that, you've committed a sin. Is there anyone that needs confession? <laughs> so All right, I'm going up here. He got he got the smack. How about a boss? He 
because in the book in the book of Exodus it says you shall not speak against anybody. Amen. Yes, Brother David. That means directly to the priest, but if the priest says something that's you can, yeah. You just need it in the rock. When you, when you see the good father, I told you what to do a thousand times. Good father, you explained something that I didn't understand. Could you show me here? <laughs> um, or could you show me in the Catholic catechism so I could further understand your point that there's no hell? He won't be able to show you here. He won't be able to show you the catechism. So guess what you do with his information? I didn't say him. And you never go hear him again until he gets converted. Amen? David's liking this information tonight. But as, so what happens to him, he got smacked right on the old kisser room. Amen? God was striking that. What else does he call there? Interesting, he calls them there a white washed. Go ahead. What, what did you say? What did your Bible say? Everybody have a white washed wall? Yeah. Right. We won't tell you what it means. So you ready for this, Brother Peter? He didn't sin. No, he did sin. He didn't know he was Well, he sinned in inverted. I don't say he was culpable, but it was a sin. If you're in the Sanhedrin, you might know a big, a lot of monkey mucks are in there. You got that? So there was a sin committed. I didn't say it was culpable. Okay, yes? The big, the big guys. The, the hoi polloi, the top, the top bananas. Okay, now what's a whitewash wall, Miss Kathy? Do you know that answer? You have no idea. That's because they painted their graves white so that they wouldn't accidentally go near them? That is correct. What they would do is they got white paint and they painted the walls around the cemetery. Hmm. Because of the sun, it would glisten and you would see kind of a glow off the, off the uh, walls. And then you know, because you're a Jew, don't go near there. So, in, in, in the book of uh, Matthew 23, Jesus, could you go to Matthew 23? Yes. Who wrote Matthew? Matthew. You can see this is where Jesus go down to verse 27. 27. Everybody with me, Matthew 23, 27? See, Jesus called them too. Woe to you. And by the way, every time you see woe, it's a word of condemnation. And when someone says, it's the prophet condemning you. Paul did not say what? Woe to you. And then he says there, Jesus, what are you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you mask wearers? Matthew 23, verse 27. You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside because they've just been freshly painted, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every kind of filth. Now, that's why Jesus has to raise the dead when he comes in contact with them. Because what would happen to him if he didn't raise the dead? Sure. He, he would buried be, them. He would bury them. He would be impure. 
They would have to be pure for a week. So who there? They would have to go through. Um, they would have to go through rituals for a week of being purified. Who buried them? Their fellow Jews. But did that let them off the hook? No. You can couldn't go to Crossroads Church and uh, just dump a body in the ground. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. oh. <coughs> My foot is hurting. So, um, verse three. Then Paul said, "Go, God will strike you, you whitewash. Do you then sit in judgment?" So he did know, brother Peter. Now, there's going to be two, there's going to be, in Jerusalem, there's two seats. The religious seat. How many know in the Catholic Church, there's lawyers and everything else? Mm. Yeah. They'll say you need a, a canonical lawyer. How many know that I have an appealing process, too, if I feel like I've been wrongly treated in the church? Does anybody know that? I haven't used it yet. Okay, I'll have David as my lawyer. Amen? Next he says there, there um, so the, the other seat was, uh, how many remember Pontius Pilate? He had a seat called, remember when Jesus was being tried? Here's the Sanhedrin. And then they had to march Jesus across the, the plaza, which is double the size of the one in Rome, if you want to get a size. No, one of, in the original, Brother Peter, in the original. Because Brother Peter took um, 27,000 pictures of that alone. And it was double the size of one in Rome. And so Jesus would have to walk across the plaza and then go along the sides. And then there, to go to Pilate was called the Antonia Fortress. And the Antonia Fortress was right on the temple. So here comes Paul. And guess what Paul is doing? What's the picture for us right now? Going through exactly what Jesus did and standing on the very spots Jesus did. Are you getting the picture? Yeah. Now, how many trials did Jesus undergo? Five. Five. How many trials does Paul go under? A lot of trials, isn't he? So, count them and see if there's five, right? Do you now? Yes. Now the name of when, when Pilate sat in on the seat is called Gabbatha. So, and how many know you all miss that detail when you read the the, the Passion? Sat on the Gabbatha seat because what they would do with the Gabbatha seat is they would kind of fold it up and bring it in. So when Pilate was judging somebody, it was folded up and brought in. So it, 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 that was the gamma okay? So, this is So now there, there's two judgments. Paul has a religious judgment and the secular judgment. Next, according to the law and yet violated the law in order to, meet, to, to, to strike him. Verse four, the attendant said, would you revile God's high priest? Verse 5, Paul has a brothers, I did not realize he was a high priest, for it is written, you shall not curse a ruler of your people. That's from the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, it's, it's a spiritual context. So nobody here is allowed to ever talk about a priest. Did you ever do that before? Everybody's clear, you are all great people to have around. Do you know when the Chancery Office gets the most complaints? Monday morning. Oh, no. <laughs> they get more phone calls on Monday morning than any other day. Isn't that interesting? Brother David. Just for a clarification. Clarification. The whole indicated that not know that he, meaning the object, Right, he didn't know that he was the high priest. Yes. Well, what for the rest? They were all priests. Well, when you read Exodus, it says right there, you got the quote, ruler. Right, that's a high priest. But I, I, I don't know, I'd have to talk to Paul. I'll have to interview him in glory. Um, 
I don't know where, where Ananias was sitting, if he was sitting on the main section there. But I mean, is it, does it apply to any priest, anybody in the city? Yes. So he would know that? Yes. And that's a loud excuse? Yes. Yes. He sinned no matter what it was I My thoughts are that Paul probably knew a whole lot of people there. So don't you ever talk about a priest in heaven? Is that an alpha bishop? Well, Lord, good. save us. Lord, save us. <laughs> Verse 6. Paul was aware that some were Sadducees. Remember, and the, the birthing of all of these sects in Judaism. How many sects uh, in Judaism are there? Three. Five. There's five groups of Jews. That's very complicated. They began in the year review. 167 B.C. Who are the five groups? Ready? Pharisees. Pharisees. Sadducees. Sadducees. And they didn't believe in the resurrection. resurrection. That's why they were Sadducees. Right. So there was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Essenes, the As far as I go. Yeah, I don't know the other two. Uh, you want some FYIing now? Yes. There's another group called the Ebionites. And they worked primarily with the poor, Brother Peter. They didn't just go to UPS and just go back and forth. They got out there. So the Ebionites, and by the way, they're not really mentioned much in the script. They're not mentioned in scripture. And then the fifth group of Jews was Christians. Oh. Christians. So there are the five groups of Jews in this time period. You got them all, Brother Peter? Mm -hmm. Next, so verse 6. Paul was aware that some were Sadducees, some were Pharisees, and so he called out before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Pharisees couldn't stand the Sadducees. It's called the Democrats versus the Republicans. <laughs> okay, you got the picture? Yeah. Okay. In the, in the world of religion, here comes the Democrats and the Republicans. Okay. Don't get nervous. We're not going to get into politics. Okay. So, no politics mentioned at the coffee break. Um, everybody talk all the politics you want. Not now, okay? And he says, my brothers, there it is again, Adel boy in Greek. Ah, I am a Pharisee. Uh-oh. Now, being a Pharisee, he believed in the Old Testament completely. He believed in the resurrection. He believed in angels. He believed in angels. So everything that the Sadducees were not believing. So now... You have some Republicans, and you have some Democrats, mm -hmm. and then when you say which side go in back, and guess what happened? This is called unholy pink pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they started. Here we go. I am a Pharisee. Now the word Pharisee, review. The word Pharisee is called the Perushim. P E R U S H I M. Everybody say Perushim. So if we were if we were hearing Paul speak, he would say Ego in the Greek. Ego emi Perushim. Or if it was Hebrew, which probably would be, he would say Ani A N I, which is I. Ani Perushim. I must embarrass him. Then more insult to injury. He says there, I am a son of Pharisees. Ben Perushim, B-E-N, Perushim. Hmm. Now he gives us credentials of his life in the book of Philippians, chapter 3. And he gives us a Pharisee of Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews, circumcised on the eighth day. Philippians 3, 3, Philippians 3, 4. So here he goes again saying, I'm a Pharisee. Now, here's some good news for you. 
every time I read the Bible when I first was growing up, every time I heard the Pharisee, you know, my favorite word would be boo. <laughs> boo. <laughs> Why? Because what I believe they did to Jesus. So was it bad to be a Pharisee? No. Um, the Pharisees were the renewal of, bless yourself on this one, they were the renewal group of the day. They started in the ripe old year 167 BC. Why that year? Because there was a man coming out of the temple called the Antichrist. Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And so they said, we got to do something to get our faith back. So they formed a group called the Pharisees. And then another group didn't like them and they said, no, they're kind of weird. We are going to form our group and they call themselves the Essenes. And then they said, no, they're, they're, too, they're too tough. We're going to be a little more liberal. We'll call ourselves the Sadducees. So we have the Republicans, the Democrats, and the Independents. <laughs> Whoa, everybody getting this? Yes. Uh -huh. And this is the world of religion, Brother Peter. Are you picking this up? E-S-S-E-N-E-S. -E -E I am on trial for hope in the resurrection of the dead. Now, if you underline that there, verse number six, everything that Paul does is and he, he teaches me this. His main teaching was on the resurrection. Jesus is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. When I go to my family celebrations, Lord save me please. <laughs> Dinner is being served. And they're all up with their plates and everything else. And sometimes it's buffet if we're too, too many of us. I guess there was like 25. So uh, we didn't have a big enough table to stretch around. So, but they all got up and said, Okay, but nobody remembered to pray. So I had to stand up. All right, hold it. And my, my brother goes, he wants to do the prayer. So I was, and I was in the midst of Democrats and Republicans. And I said, let's do the prayer. Now with them, they're all like, I felt like a bunch of vultures staring at me. <laughs> we want to eat earth. And so, of course, I want to do a 20 minute prayer. <laughs> Not advisable. Not being advised. Keep it short and we will love you. We want to see dessert by midnight. So if you under the number six, that's why he, Paul mentions the resurrection more than anything. He's alive. And all of his preaching, he has to say, Jesus is alive. Do you all believe that? Yes. Verse seven. When he had said this, a dispute broke out between them, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the group became divided. I think this is a kicker, don't you? Yeah. Paul's watching these two groups go back and forth. <laughs> Resurrection. No, there's no such thing. Resurrection. No, there's no. No, the Torah. It's only up to the book of Deuteronomy. No, it goes all the way to Malachi. No, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Paul's going, hey guys, guys, yo, guys, I'm on trial. <laughs> Can you see? And you know what? They probably sat according to their political party. Pharisees over here, Sadducees over here, and Paul in the middle. So this is really great. Amen? Yeah. Next he says there, verse number um, 8. For the, uh, and here's where we get, if you underline there, verse 8. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection. And what's Paul's main premise? Resurrection. Now, another curious note about the Sadducees. This is where we, we, their foundation can all the way take us back to a man called Zadok. And Zadok was a priest during the time of King Solomon in about the year 960 B.C. So Zadok, Zadocees, you see the words forming Sadducees or from Zadok? Mm -hmm. Okay, just for your FYI in time. So we, we can see there, there is no resurrection or angels or spirits. Now, 
one thing that really interested me once, uh, why don't the Jews accept Jesus? How many ever heard that question? And you, you want to hear a shock? Part of their answer is because when we have our Gospels, angels appeared around Jesus. What happened on Christmas night? Angels. What happened at the resurrection? Angels. What happened when Jesus was sweating drops of blood in, um, in Gethsemane? Angels. angels. Ascension. And, uh, and the angels. So when we, the more we mention angels hmm. and Jesus, they're le le not hmm. likely to believe in hmm. him. Okay? So that is a reason. Okay. Yes, sir. My friend told me about Jewish he didn't destroy the Roman army. That's what he said. That could be on a political, but I've never, never, never heard them say that. Mm. I, I worked with them a long time, for years. Years and years and years, and years. I've never heard them mention that one. I would have to talk to my friends, my Jewish friends about that. I never heard them say that. Never. Never heard them mention that. Back then it could have been true. Okay, next. Uh, well, the Pharisee can acknowledge all three. So Paul was, now was it a crime to be a Pharisee? No. It was the renewal of the dead. So if you're going to preach, now, how many were these people in Jerusalem? Ready? Want to hold your heart on this one? How many Pharisees were surrounding Jerusalem? 6,000. And what did they do when you see them walking around Jerusalem? They had all the the, the garb on, the rope. You could just see, you got, you got the picture? And so Paul says, so how did Paul appear in front of them? He had the garb on, you got it? Mm. He, he stood on Jesus' spot. All of the garb? Yeah. Because he says, I am a Jew. But I'm a Roman citizen, so you can't whip me. Next verse um, 9. A great uproar occurred, and some scribes belonging to the Pharisees stood up and sharply argued. We find nothing wrong with this man. Now, who are the scribes? What does the scribe do? Write. What are they writing? Scriptures. So when they said, we find nothing wrong with this man, what are they saying? You know, biblically, there's nothing wrong with it. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that's, so that's what Pilate said. Jesus. Yes. Now, Pilate. I'm glad you brought that up. Pilate said that Jesus was innocent three times. Interesting. But yet he dies on the cross. Wow. How can? Here is the world of religion now saying Paul is innocent. Okay, what did the world of really, what did the world of the Democrats and the Republicans say about Jesus? Shocked, they said he's innocent. I don't think they would say that today. But anyway, we find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose the spirit or an angel spoke to him. So obviously that man was a what? A Pharisee, because they only believe in what? Verse ten. The dispute was so serious that the commander, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them ordered his troops to go down and rescue him. So who came in? The Roman guards came in. Glorio. Oh. Glo so right in the Sanhedrin. Now, let's say something more about the Sanhedrin. After Jesus died on the cross, he gave a warning to the Jews. You're not going to make it more than 40 years. In Luke chapter 21, he says, see that temple right there? There will not be one stone upon another stone. So Jesus was prophesying an apocalyptic tone to the Jews. And that's when the Jews barely made it out themselves. Whoa. So what happens here then is with, with this ap ap apocalyptic tone is what do they wanted to do with Paul? Is they wanted to come and, now who rescues him? This is very interesting. Do, do the 800 
do the 800 of the Jewish guard rescue him? No. no. Who rescues him? The Romans. Why? Because at this time now, there was outright chaos in Judaism that in, and if I wanted to be the high priest that year, I would slide you somewhat. I would do, I, I called up Russia and I was colluding with Russia. <laughs> I colluded with Russia to buy papers in the election. So during this time of Paul, here's the sad thing that happened. These high priests were bought religious officials. Is that scary or what? Now, can I give you a little secret about your ordained? When a priest constantly mentions money, we need more money here, cough it up, back row, cough it up. When they, when they keep saying money, you know why they keep saying money? The spirituality doesn't exist. Here we go, whoa. whoa. Do you see that? Yeah. Show me a church where they keep saying we need more money and the church is, has all holy activities. Are you seeing this, Brother Peter? Are you thinking? Yes, sir. So now, during this time period, this is a bought priesthood. This is a lot in, in between the Democrats and Republicans, religion, the secular and the religious. You can't even discern who's who. How many want your priests to be holy? Anybody here? Yes. How many really want them to be outstandingly holy and really live for God alone? Yes. 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 When that happens, then you're going to have a holy church. If they're not God alone, I mentioned God alone. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So what happens here is, you can already see it, right? This is the background to these passages. Now what's going to happen during this time period, these people, did you see them attacking each other? What did they do to one another? If I'm yelling at you, is it a distance or am I up close and personal? Close. Are my fingers active towards you? Yes. And how close do I get to you? Too close. When I'm yelling at you. Do I stand all the way back in the room? When you disagree with me, do I stand back and yell from the back? I come to your face, man. And what happened during this time period? You get me so mad, I take out a... I take out a, my knife and kill you. What was going on during this time period? Brother killed brother. What happened? That's the main reason what happened to the temple. One of the main reasons. The temple did this. Amen. So they bought religion. The Romans come in, try to save Paul. Good stuff. Look at verse number 11. They rescued him from their midst and take him down to the combat. Verse 11. They, the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. Now, Paul now has these these appearances of God saying to him, take courage. Now this, when you follow Jesus, and this is the hardest thing of following Jesus, it's a step-by-step -step process. What do I mean by that? You and I have goals that we want to accomplish. I still have tremendous goals in my heart. But you know what the Lord says, and I don't like it, He says this to me, step by step. But I want to move. No, step. <laughs> But let's do it in a step by step. And so Paul now has to be under the step by step guidance of the journey. Now he says here verse 11, take courage. Bum, 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 bum. Now, this goes all the way back to Joshua chapter 1. You are called, does everybody know what courage means? Courage is the ability and the power of the Holy Spirit to see two roads in front of you. And you've got to put your life on the line to take one of them. How many ever did that before when you drove? 
repeat it every day. <laughs> the most sc the scariest moment when we drive, I'm sure David never had this problem. You go out and say, should I go? And you go out and the car goes, beep! <laughs> And you get really, really scared because you thought, I'm oh, dead. <laughs> That's courage that took you to go out there. Now, courage is you have two rows. How many are driving? One day I'm, I'm, I have a speaking engagement, and it's getting late. I, I am lost. And my GP, my, my cell phone is all the juice is down. Uh -huh. I'm like, and then when I did try to call, I, I hit the areas where. The cell phone goes off. I'm like, Lord, we got to talk right now. And then my gasoline goes. I said, Lord, we really got to talk. Um, I'm in the, the cell phone goes in and out. The juice is low. The, it's going. I'm like, um, God, um, it's me. You know, um, where the heck am I, God? And so what I did is I put my thumb outside. And I'm like, And then I, I did make a call. Well, drive here. I'm like, where's the, where's that road? Drive 516, five I said, where the heck are these roads? Like, the only thing I have to ask here is a cow out there. <laughs> so courage is you're in the midst of two paths. Joshua chapter one, take courage, and you've got to be able to stand and go on the path that God leads you. So let's see what he says there. Take courage, for just as you have <coughs> borne witness to my cause in Jerusalem, you also must bear it in Rome. Now, if you circle the word Rome, when you go to Rome, you go to the end of the world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He made it to, because that was, that was the agenda the, the risen Jesus would give. You've got you to gotta hit to the end of the earth. Amen? Next he says there, verse 12. When day came, the Jews made a pot. See the Jews again? And they bound themselves by oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. This is called the Nazarite vow of chapter 6 of Numbers. In other words, they wouldn't eat something. Now, is that a good vow? Does everybody here like to eat every day? Yeah. Say UPS denied Peter 20 days of it. And they said, Peter, you are just going to work here and work here until you get that work done. And you're not going to have one meal. <laughs> Do you think Peter would, would complain a little bit? Don't give them any ideas. A woman told me last night, we were talking about fasting a little bit again, and she said, I said, there's three people who fasted the 40 days, Elijah, Moses, and the Lord Jesus. And I said, I don't suggest that for any of us, where you don't eat a thing. And she says to me, my son did that. I said, you're kidding. So all during Lent, he didn't eat a thing. He just lived on those uh, green milkshakes or something like that. Mm. With all the, uh, I don't suggest you do that, amen? So, um, so why did they take the Nazarite by number six? A, I'm holy. I'll do a God vow. Because <coughs> when I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, there's an enemy in our midst. His name is Saul. I'm going to take a Nazarite vow. I'm not going to eat a thing until we what? Kill him. So guess what? I better kill him because my stomach does go. <laughs> Do you see what they're doing? Yeah. How many know this is called play religion? And a lot of people have done things in their religion with gung ho -ness, and they're going to do it. But guess what? It was not to serve God, it was their own purposes. So they put themselves under this Nazarite vow, and they said, we'll starve, we will find him. So guess what happens? Hour after hour passes, and they didn't find him, so guess what's happened? Uh-oh, my stomach is going Amen? <laughs> Verse 13, there were more than 40 who formed this conspiracy. Wow. Now, <coughs> the number 40 means mission. Jesus was tempted for 40 days. 
uh, the ark 40 days. Jonah 40 days. So the word 40 means in the Bible, mission. So we do this 40 because this is our mission. So guess what, uh, they have 40 there. Verse 14, they went to the chief priests and elders and says, we have bound ourselves by a solemn oath. Oh, guess what? Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They, they're dead. They didn't get them. How many think they, they, they cheated on, 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 on matzo snack? How many think they, they found a few matzo crackers along the way? And Peter took them to the diner and got some wraps of chicken and Caesar and everything else. <laughs> The curly French fries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how many, how many think they cheated? Anybody think? How many think they dropped? Yeah, they cheated. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. note the word there, solemn. So, what does it mean, solemn? I swear on a stack of Bibles. Everybody go, whoa. whoa. Guess what? They are dead. Mm -hmm. Amen. They swore on a stack of Bibles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they never went back to UPS again. Now, so we have bound ourselves by Salmo to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Verse 15. You, together with the Sanhedrin, must now make an official request for the commander to have him bring him down to you as though you meant to investigate this case more thoroughly. Bring him down here. Get letters. Get, get going. And to this very day, I can't move from place to place. You ready for this? I can't go to another church until I get a what? A letter. When I had aspirations, I remember Father Joe saying, don't say a word until you get the letter. <laughs> when you have the letter in your hand, then tell David. It's got to be the letter. Amen? <laughs> Even though you get the phone call, get it. The letter. Interesting, isn't it? So give us the letter. We on our part are prepared to kill him before he arrives. Notice that murder was allowed in certain circumstances. Now if you're Jewish today, ready? If you kill somebody, you are excommunicated. You can't be Jewish and kill somebody. Did you ever see all those body parts blow up in Tel Aviv? What do they summon of the blood? I don't mean going to war, that's another issue. You, you don't have the power to murder anybody because that's God's to take life or to what? To give. To give. Amen. Look at verse 16. That they couldn't condemn Jesus, but they could stone Stephen. That's right. Hmm. Look now, here we have an interesting thing about Paul's family. The son of Paul's sister. Hmm. So Paul had a sister. Does everybody know that? So this was his what? Nephew. So we know. Now, there is a Catholic belief that he was never married. There's a Protestant belief that he was. I'll give you the Bible verse for the Protestant belief. 1 Corinthians 9, 3, which says, there, our wives are in our midst. So if you talk to a Protestant, they'll say, St. Paul was married. If you talk to a Catholic, they'll say, no, he wasn't. What's the Catholic view? The Catholic view goes on to say that when you're in a tremendous special mission, you can't be married. Mm -hmm. How, what was Paul's special mission? evangelizing the world. Do you think you have Mrs. Paul? She went into the frozen food department. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have here, we have fish sticks, yeah. We, I, I always think of them as fish sticks. Look at verse 16. The son of Paul's sister, however, heard about the ambush, verse 16. So he went and entered the compound and reported it to Paul. Paul, verse 17, then called one of the centurions. What's the centurion? One who's in charge of 100 people. You got that? Now, what do we hear centurions? Because centurions were at the what? At the cross. Are you seeing similarities again? And now, did they tell Jesus not to go into Jerusalem? Yes. yes. Did Jesus listen to them? No. 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 
Because a true prophet, in order to preach the word of God, has to go to Jerusalem. Who is the prophet that walked all over this compound? Jeremiah. And Jeremiah got creamed. Big time, didn't he? Next it says there, so he took him, verse 18, and brought him to the commander, explained, the prisoner Paul called me and asked that I bring this young man to you. He has something to say. The commander took him, verse 19, by the hand, drew him aside and asked privately, what is this you have to report to me? Verse 20, the Jews have conspired to ask you to bring Paul down. Is Paul used to this? Yes, they're always conspiring against him. And you know what? Even in our own beloved faith, people are conspiring against one another. I have a list of names. Would you like to know who they all are? Nobody good. Okay. <laughs> the Jews have conspired, and, and again, that's the what? The enemy, and to bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin tomorrow. You better do that because these guys are starting to get hungry. They took the Nazarite by solemnly. <coughs> as though they meant to inquire about him thoroughly, but they did not believe him. Verse 21, more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him. They have bound themselves by oath not to eat or drink. Well, that's pretty bad. You can't even, what happens if you get thirsty? Now, these same people are going to attack John the Baptist and above all the Lord Jesus for two things. Ready? What, what are the, Matthew 11, what are the two things they attacked Jesus for? Eating and drinking. They called them a drunk, a wine bibber, and a glutton. So when you get mad at somebody, you attack their physical food supply. Matthew 11. They called Jesus a... Uh, uh, Interesting, isn't it? Amen? Are you getting this? Look with me, verse number 21. They are now ready and only wait for the consent. Verse 22. As the commander dismissed the young man, he directed him, tell no one that you gave me this information. So that's Paul's what? Nephew. Right? Then he summoned two of the centurions and said, get 200. Boy, this is really building, isn't it? Get 200 soldiers ready to go to Caesarea by 9 o'clock tonight. Now, where's Caesarea? Caesarea is 64 miles away. Look at your map, you can see Caesarea. Um, 64 miles away. Everybody see Caesarea? Okay, that's, uh, between that and Jerusalem, you can put 64 miles in there. Now, interestingly, because they would go, why 9 o'clock? Because that would be a watch during the night. How many ever heard the shepherds on Christmas night? Now, I think I have completely missed this my entire life, except this year. I got it for the first time ever. See, the Holy Spirit's still talking to me. Yes, thank you, Holy Spirit. It says the shepherds were watching their sheep by night. Now, let's give you a little more into that. Were they really watching the sheep? Yes. But what were the shepherds doing? They were on a biblical watch for something to come and the darkness would start to overtake the land. And that's when the first angel appeared, when it was darkest. When the darkest were, were really coming in. So angel number one went, Glory. Amen? That's why you have midnight mass. Okay? Good stuff. Now he says there, so here we have 200 verse 23. <laughs> along with 70 horsemen and 200 auxiliaries. This is big now. Why Caesarea? Now, Caesarea is named after Peter Salad, yes. But why Caesarea? Because it was the port. Remember we, yes. those who went to Israel? It was the port. And by the way, and Peter took 4,298 pictures of just one plaque. There's a plaque there that said, and you see the water around you, the gate was closed, you couldn't go in and see it because we were late. Now, in there there was a plaque, which you couldn't read, but I, I read it the last time, and Peter took pictures of Peter. 
it said from this spot Paul sailed to Rome. That's why I wanted you to go down there to sail links. So they take Caesarea. So they're going up to Caesarea to try to stop them there. And remember, in Caesarea is the spot where Saint Peter baptized Cornelius. Acts chapter ten, verse number nine. Verse 24, provide a mounts for Paul to arrive and give him safe conduct to Felix, the governor. So now we're going to go through another what? Trial. Here we go. Here we go. A trialing among them. Trial after trial. So how many, what number is this? Two. Two. Let's go on there. Verse number uh, 25. And then he wrote a letter with content. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency the Governor Felix greetings. <laughs> I like it, that. Okay, how do you say greetings in Latin? Do you remember? Oh. Uh, 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 you know, what is it? Oh. It's hello and goodbye. I mean the same thing. Oh, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> greetings. I just wrote a note to my, uh, the cardinal. I, you know what I said to him? Greetings. And I said, the, the, the peace of God be multiplied to you. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency, the Governor Felix the Eating. This man seized by the Jews, about to be murdered by them. I rescued them after intervening my troops, where I learned that he was a Roman citizen. I wanted to learn the reason for their accusations against him, so I brought him down to their Sanhedrin. I discovered that he was accused in matters of controversial questions of their law, and I'm not Jewish. And on any of the charges deserving death or imprisonment. Sound familiar? Yeah. Verse 30. Since it was brought to, to my attention that there be a plot against this man, I am sending to you at once and have also notified his accusers to state their case against him before you. Here come the hungry men. <laughs> so he's under, he gets saved. But what, how many people are, are walking him down? 200? 400. 70 horses. 200, 200 auxiliaries. So 400 how many people? 70. A lot of people are yeah. walking him down. Can you see Paul go, Glorio, 64 miles. Wow. wow. <laughs> Would you walk with anybody 64 miles? Mm -hmm. I do 15, 15 miles a weekend. <laughs> Every August. So the soldiers, according to their orders, took Paul and escorted him by night to Antipatris. Do they have that on your mouth? Antipatris? Yes, in between Jerusalem and Caesarea. All right, everybody look at your maps. Antipatris? Yeah. All right, everybody find Antipatris? Yeah. Verse 32. The next day they turned to the compound, leaving the horsemen to complete the journey with him. When they arrived in Caesarea, Caesarea is the what? The port. The port. Okay, good stuff. They delivered the letter to the governor and presented Paul to him. And this is Felix the cat. Felix, this is Felix. Felix the cat. And what does Felix mean? Happy. Oh, I thought it meant cat. <laughs> Verse 34. When he had read it, he asked him what province he belonged in and learned that he was from Cilicia. That's his province up north from here. Look at Cilicia. Everybody find Cilicia. Do you see Cilicia on that map? Yes. See where Tarsus is? Oh, yeah. Tarsus. Yeah. See Cilicia? Yeah, it's written sideways. It says Tarsus. Yes. He said, verse 35, I shall hear your case when your accusers arrive. <laughs> These are the guys who are starving. Then he ordered that he be held in custody in Herod's Praetorium. Everybody go, hmm. hmm. What's a Praetorium? It's like kind of the way. What, what happened? Where, where was Jesus accused? Where were they? Praetorium. What did Pilate have to do? He had to come out to the 
praetorium because the Jews, because of the Sabbath, couldn't go into where he was. Hmm. Uh, are you seeing a lot of similarities now? All right, so let's do trial number two. We got, a, we got five more minutes left. Ready? Five days later, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders. Now, remember, came down because Jerusalem is the what? Highest. It really, it really should be what? Go up. But now in the Bible, it came down because the highest mountain is Jerusalem. So Luke writes there, they came down. Hmm. So they came down with some elders and an advocate, a certain Tertullus, and they presented formal charges against Paul to the governor. Kill him, kill him, kill him. We want him dead. Morta, morta, morta. Verse 2, when he was called, Tertullus began to accuse him, since we have attained much peace through you, and reforms have been accomplished in this nation through your provident care, this is called bull, baby. <laughs> how, many, how many ever heard anybody practice religious bull? Okay, we'll try to be kind there. Now, what, so what were they doing? Powdering his news. Okay. Now, did this happen before with Jesus? Yes. If you say that, we have no friend but Caesar. Bull. So, as the master, so the disciples. Amen. Verse number two, three. We acknowledge this in every way, everywhere most excellent. Feel it. Give me a title, baby, and I'll love you. Most excellent, with all gratitude. This is bull number two. Verse number four. But in order to detain you no further, you are a very busy man. You've got many things to do. You've got to go fishing. It's a beautiful day. Take your wife and go sailing along the Mediterranean. We know, and you probably want to go in and count your bitcoins there. <laughs> your bitcoins, right? Your bitcoins. <laughs> and then I will give you, in order not to detain you further, verse four. I ask you to give us a brief hearing with your customary grace. You are so good. This is bowl number three. This is what you got to do in UPS with your bosses. <laughs> Amen. You should, you should see what Brother Peter has to go through. We found this man to be a pest. Verse 5. He creates dissension among Jews all over the world. So what is he doing? He's disturbing our religion. And he is a ringleader of the sect called Nazarenes. Now everybody underline that word Nazarenes. Initially, that was on the what? The cross. I and R. No. Idiorum, right. Asus, Nazareth, Idiorum, Rexorum in Latin. I and R. I. So now, can anything good come from Nazareth? John chapter 1. And so, when they put the word Nazareth, it was, give you a little background again, a Roman garrison town. And that's where the Holy Family would hear from Caesar Augustus. Can you imagine one day Mary saying, Joseph, it's getting near time. And they thought the baby was going to be born in Nazareth. Uh-uh. A guy on a horse comes, hear ye, hear ye. Everybody start moving. And so they went the 95 mile trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Whoa, okay, you get this? Rome. Next, this is one of the first titles that we are called Nazarene. Let me show you something, a Bible verse, extremely <coughs> difficult to interpret. Super. And it's, it'll be never mentioned to you, but I'll mention it to you. Amen? 
It's in Matthew chapter 2. Did you ever hear Matthew chapter 2 before? You make a left and go back to Matthew. By the way, you'd be the only ones in your block that does. Now this is where the Magi came in. Do you remember the Magi? Yes. You never heard of the Magi? Yes. Now go to verse 23. This is a mystery verse. You're the only one in UPS that will know this, Brother Peter. <laughs> Everybody with me in Matthew chapter 2. Verse 23. Did you find it? He went down, Jesus, and he, in a town called Nazareth, and what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Everybody go. <laughs> Good, it's about time. Now, what did Jesus read there? Everybody read it with me again. What had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, let's give you background to that because we are called the people of the Nazarene. It's a derogatory term. Number one, there's no scripture that says that. So that's why this is very mysterious. Now, the, the, it doesn't say he should be called the Nazarene. Now there was there, there was there was a there was after Herod died in 4 BC he had a son I, I think he took poison every day he drank it. the man was the man was his father was a nutcase this was nutcase number two his name was Archelaus so Mary and Joseph were all planning to go back to Bethlehem after Herod died, guess what? They didn't go back to Bethlehem. So the angel said, Mary, Joseph, go back to Nazareth. Now this verse says, what does it say there? Look what it says. Spoken through the prophets. Everybody go, hmm. Yes. Yeah. Now, here's our difficulty with that verse. Where does St. Matthew get that one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, we all believe the Bible is true. And if you, if our, the naysayers of the Bible could bring that up to us, by the way, don't get nervous, they're not going to bring it up to you. I have never been asked a question ever on my life on that Bible verse. Even Brother Peter never asked. Uh, here's what it means. Right, you quoted Isaiah 11, 1. This is the tree of Jesse. Very Advent. There was a stump on the ground of a tree. And it says, from the stump shall come a Nazir. And so, what this means is that we are, that by Jesus be calling of Nazareth on the cross, which is another good background teaching. He had to be called Nazar because he came from the stump of human existence. So Jesus of Nazareth, bringing people from the stump of their lives, which was death, on that stumpy tree, the N-A-Z-I-R is the word for stump. And so what does Matthew say here, who is Jewish, he says, if you put all the prophets together, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, the 12 minor prophets, if you put them all together, here is their message. This is mind-blowing. Jesus is coming, and you know what we're going to call him? 
a Nazarene. That's a, that's a, that's a mind-blowing teaching right there. Miss Kathy, you have another quote? Yeah, five seconds. Nazarene, the I am is plural. Yes. So, yes. Very interesting. Brother Peter, did you get that? It is fascinating concept, isn't it? Yes. So every time I read this, I said, that's what basically Matthew made all the promise. He's basically saying that God is the great message that he's a Nazarene. So when you read the prophets, everybody points to Jesus, but here's another factoid for you. They only point to Jesus, or specifically, I should say, point to Jesus as the Nazarene. What does that mean? Does it, that a robe in Nazareth? Yes, but that's not the... So the, that verse 23, how I many know we totally missed that verse our whole lives? Yes. Do you see the, the punch to it? Do you see the bite in it? It means coming from the stump, mm -hmm. he will take your stump, ma'am, and give you a life. Yes? Yeah, so we can't get too well, so... You're welcome is, always to move up. What is the stump? Isaac, look, at, look in your Bible. You're welcome to move up. <laughs> Isaiah 11, 1. Oh, Isaiah 11, 1. Why don't we all go there and look at that? This is one Christmas verse I never get to preach. Hmm. Merry Christmas, everybody. Tonight's message is you all come from a stump. And look what happened. Eleven one. Okay, somebody want to read? Go, Brother Peter. Oh shoot! I underline the word shoot. Oh shoot! Everyone in Isaiah eleven one. I underline the word shoot, and you put in there N A Z R R Nazir. Shall sprout from the stump. Shall sprout from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is David's father. And from his roots, a bud shall blossom. That's why they had to go back to Nazareth. Everybody getting this? Did you get it, Dr. Phoenix? It's deep, isn't it? Father, um, in the other major prophets, does it also mention the shoot? No. Not at all? No. Jeremiah might, might tamper with it a little bit. Oh. Yeah. yeah oh. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23, mm. which, by the way, if you go to daily mass, they just read that. I mean, when they read all these readings, I go nuts. Do you know they're wow. pertains to another reading? Wow. And it says, he says this. Oh, well, let me do a little correction on it. It says the branch, which would be the, the Nazir. Also, the prophet Zechariah mentions the branch. <coughs> so what he does, what Matthew does, it says, here's Isaiah, here's Jeremiah, and here's Zechariah, which is the end. And then he says, all the prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's what I believe he means. I'm going to talk to uh, Matthew. Here's what I believe he means. The prophets pertaining to the, to the Bethlehem experience of prophecy, they all say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Isaiah 11, 1. Do, do you see Jeremiah 23? Yes. You see the branch in there? It's the same thing. All right, want to read that to us? We're, we're going to go on this holy tangent because it's Christmas time. Okay, that's 23. Uh, Jeremiah 23. 5. Jeremiah 23, 5. Go. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous shoot. All right, now put in there, Nazir. Thank you. Hmm. 
interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I also, too, it, it's in the book of Zechariah. I'm trying to think of it. i got to go online to get that. Was it it check the portrait? Five? No, it's the prophet Zechariah. So, that's a long background. You like that background? Yeah. It's meaty, isn't it? And then we go back and we're done. Acts 23. We'll, we'll stop in verse 5. Um, we found him to be a pest. Chapter 24, verse 5. He creates dissension among Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the sect called the Nazarene. So, now we, we, we saw deep insight on the birth of Christ and the death of Christ and his disciples. That was a wallop of a verse, isn't it? I love background. Do you love background, man? Yes. Now you really understand what's going on there. Lord willing, we will be here next week and we will continue, Lord willing. Amen? Amen. Now let's see, does everybody get all the announcements? There will be Healing Mass first Friday in St. Mary's in Closeton. I'm working on a day of renewal Friday and Saturday here, but you've got to advertise. You've got to be like an Edna and get out there. We'll do it. We'll do. We'll do. A, we'll do a deliverance session here, and then. Um, we will do, um, we got to plan our Seder coming up. Would you like a Seder with us? Yes. Yeah, the Seder was so much longer. Oh, that's great. So we got to give you dates for Seder. we got to give you dates for Divine Mercy. And we, I got, I, st I still didn't call. Uh, we're going to take a day of renewal in St. Joseph's in Sterling. Now some of you are telling me you need a Saturday. Well, I will. No, you want it. Yawning is not permitted in here. So we're going to go on a day of renewal from 9 to 4 with lunch. Would you like to come? Yeah. Yes. It's on Saturday nights. So what we'll do is we'll go up into the mountain. We will have a theme day. Anybody here wants to propose the theme? We can propose the theme. We'll have two talks. We'll have mass, confessions, lunch together, quiet time prayer. 9 in the morning to 4, so we've got to arrive at Sterling at 9 a.m., okay? I do not. I do not. They'll probably around tomorrow. So you all want a Saturday? David, would you come? David, if we get you outside your house, <laughs> Good stuff. Did you anything new, Brother Peter? Always, yes. I Brother did. Peter? I'll go slowly. Exodus, chapter of that, where Moses judged him. What was that? Judge to have the people? Uh, That's where the 70 judges began. Oh, the 70 judges? Uh, Exodus 18. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings upon us. Thank you that we follow the Nazarene. Thank you, Jesus, for Christmas that you came from the stump of Jesse. And there was a, it was impossible to have any life from that stump. And you give, us, uh, you give us new life from all the stumps of our lives. All of our brokenness, you still come through our brokenness. So bless this word to our dear hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. See you? I'm, I'm sure I'll see you. A holy Christmas to you. you if anybody wants to join me, Sunday at 12. And then I'm doing the Christmas Eve at 5.30. Midnight Mass Con celebrated and Christmas Day at 12. Easy, easy.